Hello and welcome to the Christ and Culture webcast. I'm your host, Taylor DeSoto. Today, I'm going to be doing a positive presentation of the Kama Yohanneum, or 1 John 5, 7. Uh, if you have a modern Bible, you can go ahead and open it up and look at 1 John 5, 7. Uh, yours will read differently than, let's just say, an NKJV or a KJV or an MEV or a Geneva Bible or any, uh, any Bible that was translated from the uh, Texas Receptus. So, so you've probably heard that this verse is uh, doesn't was not in the original um, manuscripts of the Bible. Uh, this cannot be proven. So, what I'd like to do today is give a maybe lengthier presentation of of um, why I believe it to be scripture. So the verse reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. That's 1 John 5, 7 through verse 8. So this Johannine phrase, or phrase of John, has been contested essentially as far as you can go back into church history. It is certainly difficult to defend using extant manuscript data, but it's not impossible, as a lot of critics of this verse claim. When citations from church history are examined alongside the manuscripts that do contain it, which we do have, a reasonable defense is certainly possible. Unfortunately, the conversation regarding the comma UNAM has sort of been diluted with a number of misinformed anecdotes, blanket statements, and these don't generally or accurately represent the transmission history of 1 John. In order to provide a defense of the verse as being authentic, the information must be clarified, examined, and explained. There are several claims that must be examined and refuted, I would say, in prior to and in order to offering a presentation for its inclusion in John's first epistle. The first being that the papyri discoveries of the 20th century prove the verse to be inauthentic. The second being that the Christian church was unaware of the verse in the Greek manuscripts until it was added from the Latin tradition. The third being that it was only added into the Greek text by way of Erasmus being compelled by a wager made in an unguarded moment. The final being that its lack of use in matters of, of, the, of Arian controversies throughout church history is proof that it is not original to John's first epistle. So let's take a look at the papyri evidence. The papyri evidence are often used, in my opinion, as a crude weapon to debate and invalidate the use of Greek New Testaments made prior to their discovery in the 20th century. So papyri discovered in the 20th century, therefore any text criticism done prior to that point is invalid. The reality is that the shape of modern textual criticism was already very well developed by the time the two major papyri caches were found between 1930 and 1980. This is especially true considering that less than five papyri had been published at the turn of the 20th century. The focus of modern textual criticism in the 19th century was the Vatican Unseal Manuscript and was mostly indifferent to the minuscule manuscripts which made up the majority of the extant or surviving Greek texts. The 20th century papyri finds, often represented as being purely Alexandrian, contain enough different readings, whether you want to call them Byzantine or Western, to demonstrate that this claim is simply a misunderstanding or, hopefully not, but an intentional misrepresentation of the nature of these manuscripts. That's not to say that there's a majority Byzantine in the papyri, but they exist, which demonstrates the proof of an early Byzantine text in the papyri. In terms of the topic at hand, the papyri are actually quite scarce in terms of representation in the Catholic epistles. Many Christians are unaware of the fact that 1 John could not be created with purely extant papyri, let alone an entire New Testament. A careful inspection of the Nesselalon's 28 text shows that only two papyri in the appendix, that only two papyri contain any portion of 1 John, and neither of these contain this, the section that we're talking about in 1 John 5. It is accurate to say that the papyri do not testify to 1 John 5, 7, though it's rather misleading considering the papyri do not contain most of 1 John. In other words, if the standard for accepting or rejecting a text was based on survival in the papyri witness, 
the New Testament would be as filled with as many holes as the papyri themselves. The assertion that the papyri communicate anything regards to the Kamionam is strange indeed. The discovery of the papyri, though exciting for textual critics, did not revolutionize textual criticism by any standard. Elgin J. Epp, who labeled the time period between 1930 and 1980, the period of the papyri, says this regarding the significance of the papyri data. Quote, to characterize 20th century textual criticism as an interlude is, on one hand, to suggest something negative. It affirms that the critical work of this period is not the main feature, but a subsidiary or a secondary and minor performance following a portion of the main event. On the other hand, there is a positive aspect for interlude implies, if not demands, that another major act is to follow. And it is this it is this to which the interlude leads and for which it prepares. Though Epp doesn't discount the discovery by, of the papyri by any means, he certainly doesn't hyperinflate the value of this data as some do. In describing the period of the papyri as an interlude, Epp understands the period leading up to and following the papyri as more significant than the 20th century papyri finds. Epp recognizes, alongside the vast majority of his contemporaries, that the work of Tischendorf, Lachman, and Westcott and Hort play a more significant role in the story of modern textual criticism than the papyri. The examination of the papyri clearly demonstrates that the role they play in the discussion of the Kamioneum specifically is insignificant and should be regarded as such. It must be recognized that the claim that the lack of commentary on 1 John 5-7 by a Christian church throughout the ages is a proof of its addition later in church history is an argument from science. silence. Let me say that again. In order to argue that a lack of evidence is a somehow a positive uh, argument against the comma would be an argument from silence. It can easily be demonstrated that the early church fathers did not provide commentary on every verse of the Bible. They just simply didn't, or if they did, we don't have it available to us today. If the standard for the inclusion or removal of scripture was based on the existence of commentary and sermons by the early church fathers, more texts than the Kamio and Nam would have to be cast aside, a lot more. Yet there's been commentary on the exclusion of the verse throughout church history. John Calvin, in his commentary on the verse, notes this, quote, the whole of this verse has been by some omitted. Jerome thinks that this has happened through design rather than through mistake, and that indeed only the part on, on the part of the Latins. But, even, but as even the Greek copies do not agree, I dare not assert anything on the subject, since, however, the passage flows better when the clause is added, and as I see that it is found in the best and most approved copies, I am inclined to receive it as the true reading. This is his commentary on 1 John 5, 7. Calvin notes two important things here regarding external evidence. First, that Jerome, a 4th century theologian and historian, comments on the removal of the passage. Regardless of how you interpret Calvin's analysis, you can say, oh, Calvin was just talking out of the side of his mouth, he was lying. His commentary on the passage demonstrates its existence, I think overwhelmingly. Second, Calvin claims that in the 16th century, when he was writing, the, quote, best and most approved copies, end quote, contained the phrase. David Martin, a 17th century French theologian, comments on Jerome's preface to the seven canonical epistles. Quote, in this preface, St. Jerome complains of certain Latin translators who, in their versions of the New Testament, had omit omitted the seventh verse of the fifth chapter of St. John's epistle. And for the cause, he blames them as unfaithful interpreters who, turning aside from the true religion, had attempted to throw out their translation this text, which, which is, saith he, one chief support for the Catholic faith. This preface is often contested as being a forgery. This particular thing I just quoted, the proof that Jerome talked about what was going on, it's often just called a forgery. Someone made up Jerome's words, to which Martin responds, quote, Dr. Burnett says in, all, in his first letter that he saw this preface in a Bible at Geneva at least of 700 years standing, another in Basel said to be above 800 years old, and a third of the same antiquity at Zurich, and three others at Strasbourg, wrote in the time of Charles the Great. It appears based on the wide distribution of this preface, the one that includes the quote-unquote forgery, 
that it is truly authentic to Jerome. This means that in the 4th century, the phenomenon was observed that translators were omitting the phrase from their translations. Martin further comments that the presence of this preface in translations in copies that do not contain the verse is evidence that the text was edited without concern for the preface. Yet the accusation stands that the preface was added and the verse never there. The contrary conclusion could also be drawn that the copying of the manuscript was done separately from the prefatory material, which was pretty common, and thus the preface remained as an oversight after the removal operation was completed. Finally, there is evidence that Jerome had contemporaries who commented on the passage. Around the time of Jerome's death in AD 420, Eucurius, the Bishop of Lyons, says this, quote, As to the Trinity, we read in St. John's Epistle, there are three which bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. Jerome and Eucurius were not the only ancient theologians who commented on the passage. St. Cyprian, makes reference to the passage in the 3rd century in his discourse against the Novatian schism entitled De Simplicitate Prelatorium. Quote, Our Lord hath said, I and my Father are one, and it is again written of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost that these three are one. Father, further, Athanasius, or possibly pseudo-Athanasius, origin or possibly pseudo-origin, Gregory of Nazianzus, John Chrysostom, John of Damascus, Tertullian, Priscillian, and Augustine all quote, paraphrase, or reference this passage in their works and homilies. These church fathers often employed paraphrastic language, but in the case of Cyprian, Priscillian, and Augustine, they seem to directly quote the passage in part or in whole. This should not be uh, ignored. You might say, well, it's a paraphrase, so they, it could have just been a tradition that made its way into the text. Again, that's rather assumptive. This is the challenge we'll, while com with combing through the annals of time. Data can be interpreted, qualified, or disqualified at the discretion of the reader and, the distributed, and distributed to the masses until it becomes common opinion. There's enough evidence to demonstrate that the Kamio Aeneum was available in the early church, and also evidence that it was highly disputed passage. It must be recognized that the writings of the early church have not been preserved in all totality, and thus all the writings of the early church are not available to the modern audience. It is certainly possible that there was more discourse regarding the phrase in question, but it can either be proven or disproven because of the lack of extant data. It should certainly raise suspicions when the claim is made that the early church lacked complete awareness of the verse, as this is just not the case. Even though the evidence is indeed slim for the passage, it is completely unwarranted to say that the early church was unaware of this phrasing. Finally, it is important to recognize that even if all the writings of the early church were extant, the patristic authors did not comment on every single verse, and thus the argument from silence is equally as thin as the thing it seeks to prove. If this was the standard for authenticating a text, more than just 1 John 5-7 should be called into question. It is a standard like this that cannot be applied unilaterally across all text and should be avoided altogether. Further evidence is stated against the inclusion of the common Johannaeum in the anecdote regarding Erasmus. It is said that Erasmus made a wager with one of his opponents and that the manuscript was produced to force his hand in including the verse in his third edition of the Novum Testamentum. Though I've already talked about this on our podcast and everything, there is one observation pertinent to the discussion at hand that I would like to make regarding the use of the anecdote. It is apparent that the interpretation of Erasmus's correspondence between himself and Lee and Stunica has been misunderstood and misrepresented. This is evidenced by looking at the primary source itself. It is obvious that no such wager was made. That being said, it should be noted that there was a reason for Stunica and Lee's challenge to Erasmus namely, that they believed it should be included. Combine the witness of these two rivals of Erasmus and the testimony of many that the verse existed in extant manuscripts, it seems that their objections were founded in reality. If Erasmus's initial inclusion of the verse was compelled by his fear of rejection by the general populace, it seems that the verse in question was indeed available and recognized by the Christian church in the 16th century. So this leads us to the lack of proof in Arian controversies.
Why didn't they quote that? Scan any number of commentaries produced after the 19th century and you will find a number of scholars presenting this argument as the nail in the coffin for the Kama Yohanaim. Though it does seem compelling at first glance, it is important to remember that not all, not all correspondence from the various Arian controversies are surviving. In the initial Nicene contest, contest was over the divinity of Christ, not the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Though the Kama Yohanam is a powerful witness to the unity of God, there are many other places that are more profitable concerning the divinity of the Son. Further, it is possible that the Kama Yohanam would not have been used because of the nature of who they were arguing against and what they believed. The Sabellians were attempting to refute the distinction between the Father and the Son, and the final phrase of the disputed verse says, quote, and these three are one, end quote. In fact, utilizing this verse as a proof text might have been more of a stumbling block than anything in the discussion at hand in the 3rd and 4th centuries. Additionally, since the nature of the discussion was the incarnate Christ, a verse discussing the heavenly witness of God would have been irrelevant and if not counterproductive. It is also interesting that an argument from silence would be used as some sort of ultimate argument. The absence of evidence is not definitive evidence in itself. The same could be said for the discussion of paedo-baptism. It cannot be confirmed or denied that infants were, denied, were, were baptized in the New Testament, therefore it is a weak argument on both sides. The use of good and necessary consequences should be allowed, but when the intention of the author is unknown, it is best to remain silent. There is no extant data regarding the reasons for the specific proof texts used by the participants in the various Arian controversies throughout the church history, so it is better to remain silent than to speak for them as to why they didn't use it. So let's present a positive case for the Kama Yohanim. The Kama Yohanim is indeed the most difficult passage to defend, especially against those who deny the authenticity of non-Alexandrian readings. In this presentation, I will examine the Greek support for the passage, the commentary by various theologians, and the internal evidence of the disputed passage. Greek support. The Kama Yohanim is supported by 11 Greek manuscripts, six of which were corrected by a second hand to add the verse. As discussed earlier, there are zero extant papyri manuscripts containing 1 John 5, and of the near 6,000 extant manuscripts we do have, just under 500 contain any part of 1 John at all. It is important to note that, the, that though the majority of these extant witnesses do not contain the disputed verse, the majority of these extant manuscripts also exclude all of the verses past chapter 2 of the epistle, so it's slightly misleading to say that most of the manuscripts exclude this passage. This does not mean that there were only ever 11 manuscripts throughout the history of the New Testament copying that contained the passage. It simply means that 11 have survived. This is perfectly reasonable, as hand copying of manuscripts was largely discontinued after the printing press, and the paper is prone to destruction by just about everything. In the last 200 years, the theory that the oldest surviving manuscripts were the best without question has held its place as the chief principle of textual criticism. The restructuring of these principles has inserted doubt into the theory, and it may be wise to surrender the argument on the available data. These late manuscripts that contain the comma could have easily been copied from a manuscript of great quality and antiquity. There is plenty of evidence, by the way, of theologians throughout the ages that, that testify these great number of manuscripts contain that great a great number of manuscripts contain this passage. I have already demonstrated that Calvin and in other presentations that Turretin and John Owen agreed to this. Francis Chanel of St. John's College in Oxford said this in the 17th century, quote, these words in 1 John 5, 7 are to be found in copies of great antiquity and best credit, end quote. Further, in Codex Vaticanus, there are three dots left by the scribe at 1 John 5, 6 through 8 that indicate the scribe knew of a textual variant. This is available publicly on the internet for all to see. Go and look at the manuscript. That means that this text was disputed as early as the 4th century, which is coincidentally when many other passages were being omitted from specifically Alexandrian manuscripts. If anything, the exclusion of the passage from the manuscript tradition is evidence that the passage was contested early on in the transmission process, not that it was absent to begin with. I have called into question and demonstrated the lack of integrity of those manuscripts formerly belonging to the Alexandrian family on my channel before, so it should not be surprising that they would contain such an omission. Let's look at internal support. Though many modern commentaries dismiss the disputed verse as being incoherent, 
Theologians for centuries have found the passage fits most comfortably at verse 7. Remember Calvin, who said, quote, since, however, the passage flows better when this cause is added, and as I see that it is found in the best and most approved copies, I am inclined to receive it as the true reading, end quote. Calvin knew Greek better than, I would say, any scholar alive today. The verse indeed seems to be required to fit the flow of the passage. Not only is it parallel to, the, to quote, these three bear witness on earth, end quote, which is a common pattern for the apostle, there are, there are syntactical ramifications if the passage is not authentic. R. L. Dabney notes the article in verse 8 has no antecedent without verse 7, as you would expect in the structure of the sentence. In the 4th century, Gregory of Nazianzus comments that the passage is confused in its grammar without the verse phrase that we now know as verse 7, in that after using three masculine gendered words, he follows with three neuter words, which is, quote, contrary to the definitions and laws which you, which you, which you have in your, and your grammarians have laid down, end quote. This is a 4th century bishop. Dabney agrees with Gregory's analysis. Given the parallel structure which is common to John and the strange grammar construction without verse 7, it seems unlikely that the passage was originally penned from verse 6 to 8, omitting verse 7. Conclusion The Kamioanaeum has been one of the most widely contested passages in the history of the transmission of the New Testament, alongside with the ending of Mark and the Pericope Adultere. Given that many of the claims regarding the phrase can be demonstrated to be false, it should be considered way more carefully than it is currently. It is important to note that throughout the transmission of the text of the New Testament, heresies and theological controversies have indeed resulted in contest and debate over which passages truly belong in the scripture, and in some cases, those scriptures being removed. I believe this to be one of them. It should not surprise anybody that a passage that clearly demonstrates the unity of God, his Trinitarian nature, would be so hotly contested amidst every ebb and flow of the Arian controversy. Yet in the modern period, it is not a Trinitarian controversy that has called this verse into question. It is the method of modern textual criticism and the proponents of it that serve as the accuser to this text of scripture. It is only because of lack of early extant manuscripts and dismissal of early church awareness of the passage that it is so easily discarded from the text. But the early church does address this verse, even though it might be paraphrastic, and there are indeed extant manuscripts that support it as authentic, though they are later. It comes down to a presupposition of the text. If you believe that it does not belong, the data can be interpreted to demonstrate that it is not Johannine. If you believe that it does belong, the data can show the contrary. The assaults against this verse and the spread of misinformation by modern text proponents certainly do not make the effort to defend this passage any easier. Instead of utilizing modern science to support what has been accepted by the Christian church, it is used as a launch to launch an attack upon it. This should cause pause to anybody who understands the warnings found in scripture regarding the addition or subtraction from God's word. I think I presented a very positive case for the Kamiyo Anam. I hope this has been helpful. This has been your host, Taylor DeSoto with Christ and Culture. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and we'll see you next time.